All right, everyone, welcome again for anyone who uh, jumped on late there. Again, my name is Ben Tyson. I'm the executive director of Rise Together LA, uh, the newest movement in LA uh, uh, politics and local government. Uh, we're really excited to be joined here today by Councilmember Kretz, who's running for Los Angeles City Controller in the 2022 elections. A uh, little kind of brief summary here about what we're going to be doing. We're just going to be asking some uh, Karen from the council member about his uh, plan and vision, why he's running uh, and what he hopes to do as our next city's controller. Then we'll get into a few uh, questions about some of the top issues facing our city. Uh, hopefully we can get to a couple more uh, more fun rapid fire ones at the end, but uh, we'll see how time goes. We're, we're only supposed to be here for 30 minutes uh to kind of try and keep this more more compact interesting this is the start the start of a, a whole series of these that we're going to be trying to do with every single uh, candidate for city uh, office in los angeles over the next few months so we're really honored and grateful for the council member to join us today in kicking this off i do want to disclaim up front that this is not a part of any endorsement process or consideration. This is just a chance for the council member to speak to the people, members of our movement. We are recording this, so we'll be sharing this online on social media and such in the uh, days, weeks, and months to come, uh, but just a resource for people to learn a, bit, a little bit more about him, uh, what his vision is for the city and how uh, he wants to make a difference in it uh, for all of us. Uh, so uh, we are really excited here that Rise Together, we are, uh, like I said, the newest movement in uh, Los Angeles politics. We are bringing people together from across the city who uh, want to take back the city. We'd say, you know, fo focus on the fact that there's going to be hundreds of thousands of new voters in the Los Angeles city elections for the first time ever this year. And we're really excited about that. And all of the, the candidates and their process, you know, you know, we like to say that candidates in a race will, are competing for the same 17 mo minutes of a voter's attention, right? Because that's how long the average person takes to make up their mind as to who they're voting for in an election. Uh, and so we'll leave that to the council member in his, in his election next year. What we're doing is we want to speak to people in all the minutes preceding that to talk about what the possible solutions are for LA so that people, we all know that, you know, change is possible and how we can all take part to make a difference. Um, so, um, we're really grateful everyone to be a part of this year. Um, with that, I will turn it over uh, to the council member. Uh, if you wanna give us a little bit of background about yourself and uh, why you're running this year. And thanks again for joining us. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, uh, I'm LA City Council Member Paul Koretz and I appreciate the great opportunity to address your members. I represent Council District 5, which covers part of the Valley and the West Side. And I'm one of the most experienced candidates ever to run for city office. And I realize that cuts both ways. Um, I helped to found the city of West Hollywood in 1984. I got elected to the West Hollywood City Council in 1988 and served there for 12 years. I was in the state assembly for six years from 2000 on, and I was elected to the LA City Council in 2009. I was also the Southern California director of a major environmental group. And I know that the purpose of Rise Up is to create the change that LA needs, which is great, but I don't agree that the only people that uh, can make change are people that have never held public office uh, or that, that uh, anyone in office can't make those changes. I've been fighting for change and creating change on the issues I care about and by and large, the issues that you care about for decades. And my stubbornly continuing those fights for many years have made a difference and continue to do so. And that includes battling for strong gun control, fighting to help climate change and for other environmental protections, uh, fighting for improved public safety and greater efficiency and transparency in public safety, uh, pushing for criminal justice, equity, and anti-recidivism and diversion programs, uh, regulating smoking in public places and preventing drunk driving fatalities, reducing waste and inefficiency in government, fighting for labor and working families, authoring anti-discrimination policies, leading on health protections from AIDS to COVID, and fighting cruelty to animals, just to mention a few examples. So, let me give you a couple examples of the, the length of my fight on some of these. Um, on gun violence and gun control. Uh, a friend of mine who owned a pharmacy on the corner of the block I lived on um, was robbed at gunpoint three times in a month back in the 70s. 
And we decided to place a ballot initiative on the California ballot to regulate handguns. It didn't get the hundreds of thousands of signatures it needed, but it was the beginning of the gun control movement in California. After I was elected to the West Hollywood City Council in 88, I authored uh, legislation to ban assault weapons in West Hollywood. But this was the first city in the country that had done that without needing to have a massacre first. And other cities followed suit. It helped provide momentum for uh, state legislation and eventually a federal assault weapons ban. Um, in the state legislature, I passed a ban on 50 caliber rifles, which can kill someone from a mile away and split them in half. Um, that potent a uh, weapon doesn't belong in non-military hands, and I was proud to pass that. And currently I'm working on legislation to ban ghost guns in Los Angeles, which are guns that are put together in pieces from kits and they're legal, but they don't have to pass background checks and they don't have serial numbers to identify them. So they're perfect for criminals that can't have guns and others that aren't allowed to have guns and they're completely untraceable. It's a huge problem. A third of the guns that the LAPD takes off the street are these ghost guns and they've committed 24 homicides this year using ghost guns. So uh, just to show, you know, I, I haven't dropped an issue that I've worked on for 45 years um, and I keep fighting. The same is true for one other example with the environment and climate change. Um, I've passed an ordinance banning millions of plastic bags that were given out in supermarkets and uh, wasted a tremendous amount of natural resources and sources and clogged our streams and rivers and oceans. Um, as LA's rep on the Metropolitan Water District, I got them to spend an uncharacteristic $350 million on turf removal to reduce the amount of water used for landscaping. I completed, I'm completing a successful fight to protect our wildlife by creating wildlife corridors in our hillsides. Um, my efforts made us one of the first cities to declare a climate emergency and I, working with other cities, we now have 2000 cities that have declared climate emergencies across the world, including London as an example. Um, I also created the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office in Los Angeles, which we believe is the first one in the world focused on protecting frontline communities that bear the brunt of the pollution and indigenous communities, and also with a focus of just transition for oil and gas workers out of those industries to good environmental jobs. So those are an example of a lifetime of fighting um, for change. But how does that connect to the Office of Controller and why am I running? Well, the first priority of the elected controller is to find efficiencies and cost savings. And I've been focused on this since I first got elected to council in 2009 in the middle of the Great Recession. Uh, council was proposing 4,000 plus layoffs to solve our revenue shortfall. Uh, I led the fight against this, working with our labor partners. We were coming up with a number of ideas for efficiencies to save money so it wouldn't be necessary. Most of them weren't implemented quickly enough. So we avoided the layoffs primarily by, uh, by using uh, uh, early retirements and through other, other different actions but some of the efficiencies were passed then. Some I've continued to work on stubbornly. Um, some of them have taken 12 years. Some of them are just being completed now. Um, but I really learned that you can look for efficiencies. They're usually not costly. Sometimes you do have to invest money to save money, but it all makes sense. So one example of something I pushed for for 12 years and is almost completed but I couldn't talk them into during the recession was digitizing employee personnel files. So you make the tiniest change in any employee's personnel file, you have to go to seven different file cabinets with seven different clerks. They have to take out the paper file, make a hand entry and put the file back. Needless to say, that's time intensive, incredibly inefficient. And it's, it took me years to get people to take it seriously but they're in the process of scanning the old uh, files. They have thousands of new employees that are already included. Uh, it makes it much easier 
at times when we had to do virtual work, the ones that were in the system were able to access from home. Uh, those that are still requiring paper, paper files, not. But once these are all completely entered, this will save thousands of hours of time that otherwise clerks could be devoting to much more important tasks and will save us many millions of dollars. So just an example of that. The second key function of the controller's office, in my eyes, is the responsibility to perform policy audits. And with 30 years of legislative experience, in a variety of positions. I think I have a unique perspective on public policy. Um, I would review key departments and make recommendations on how they can function better, where their priorities should lie, but I can also audit programs. So for example, let's look at all of our homeless programs, which work best and merit more funding and focus, which are inefficient and should be reduced or, or eliminated. What new ideas should be added to the mix? How should we uh, deal with our, our, our loss of program? Should it be improved? Should it be replaced? And you know, look at our climate change and sustainability programs. What do we do well? What have we not followed up on? What new ideas should we be introducing? Also, one last thing, a key component of these audits is getting them heard by council and departments and working with departments on their implementation. And as someone with a an excellent relationship with all council members, um, with knowledge and a working relationship with city departments, and having chaired the committee that deals with audits, I'd have a greater ability to impact these audits probably than any other previous controller, and certainly more than my opponents with little or new, no relevant department relationships and council relationships. The controller also can bring uh, better transparency and online access, which controller Galperin has led the way on, and I would just build on his legacy. And I'd say lastly, controller is not a flashy job, so few politicians seek it out. With my experience, most people would run for mayor, but I don't like seeking the limelight. I'd rather just be able to have a major impact without the flash of having a highly visible job. I just want to do the work. And that gives you a little sense of who I am and why I'm running for controller. And now I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, council member. We really appreciate that. And it's really great to, for us to hear from, you know, people from all, all backgrounds, particularly people who, you know, have such long uh, history as yourself in elected office that can offer unique perspective on uh, where our problems come from and, and where do we go on that. And um, just so the audience knows, uh, we have a series of few questions here. If you have additional questions that we don't get to here, you feel free to email them to me directly at contact at risetogether.la. Uh, and we can try and uh, pass any of those along to the, the council member uh, to answer or that we can answer about ourselves. Um, always happy to engage as much as possible. But in the interest of time, we're just going to kind of go through a few here. And I want to start with the kind of what one of we view as the kind of the overriding uh, issue that we want to tackle in upcoming to 2022 is the fact that in the past, upwards of 75% of people who live in Los Angeles believe that no matter what they do, no matter you know who they vote for, nothing will ever make a difference and nothing will ever get better. And it certainly doesn't have to be that way. And certainly someone who's been involved in yourself knows that that's, you know, that mistrust in public services is not well-founded in, 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 in what can be. And so we want to be a part of helping to rebuild that public trust. And I think you touched on some interesting parts about how the city's control, the city controller's office can be a unique part of that, right? So if we, one of the things that we look at is how, you know, we spent over a billion dollars on the homelessness uh, crisis in the city over, you know, the past several years. And it's, a, it's been a top priority for a long time, but a lot of LA voters, I would say most of them would be hard pressed to name a single specific program or initiative that is addressing homelessness in their communities, unless, you know, because most people are just not as politically attuned uh, to the workings of their city government. So I'm wondering if you think that the, the city controller's office could or should have a role in helping people understand better what money is being spent on in terms of combating the homelessness issue in the city. Well, I, I think it may be true, although I'm not sure that 90% of the people have never heard of the HHH program, which they, uh, which all voters just about voted on and many voted for. Um, and some people actually before its creation 
told me, I want to help. Let me know. Tax me. So people were very willing to help on, on this issue. Now, we told people it would take 10 years to build 10,000 units of affordable housing. Um, it probably won't take that long, but it's taken some years. We've shot ourselves in the foot in some ways and caused it to be slower than it needed to be. And I think the, the controller could look at how we've handled this, how we've done some other things relating to homelessness with auditing and analysis and findings and suggesting efficiencies. Um, I point out though that I haven't waited for to become controller to, to be active in this arena. You know, I go back probably 25 years ago, West Hollywood created Foundation House largely with my leadership, which was the predecessor to the PATH program that was Foundation House joining with a Hollywood program. Um, I was one of the founders of that. And uh, 20 years later, they now have around 2,500 units. They've largely moved from a model of, uh, of, of homeless shelters to individual units. It's a very successful program. Uh, it helps 2,500 people at a time. Um, but obviously, it certainly hasn't solved the whole program problem. It's, it's become worse. Um, I have a number of ideas. Some are, are in place. And this is the kind of thing I would expect a controller to suggest. Um, we need to look at beyond just ex building expensive permanent supportive housing, which we also have to do. What can we do that's preventative? So for instance, I introduced uh, the creation of a program called ev eviction defense. So if a landlord comes up with a scam reason to evict a tenant, if they don't have legal representation, they're usually out anyway. If they have a lawyer, then their chances are they keep their home and you keep them off the street. So it took me years to get it funded. I believe we have $15 million in this year's budget to do it. Also, as another example, we've been requiring creation of affordable housing in large market rate projects, mm -hmm. but we don't track it at all. So landlords are charging market rate or they're moving in. Uh, their cousin is going to UCLA and has no income, but they're not setting it aside for people that need affordable housing. So I pushed to create a database. I was told for years it was impossible. Now we have the database. We're creating a list of people that need affordable housing. And without, with virtually no cost, we are creating affordable housing that homeless people and low-income people can access. So there are a lot of programs like that. I have other ideas that aren't implemented yet, other things that I've done, like uh, insisting that when we did our first tiny home village, and it cost $130,000 per unit that we, we analyzed that and reduced the cost. I believe it's now down to around 30,000 per unit and hopefully continuing to drop. So that's great. Apples, but that's what the controller has to do. No, we I analyze, look at the thought process. How can we do this better? And I think that actually ties great into the next question I wanted to, to pose to you because, you know, you mentioned how you, you analyzed the tiny homes project and were able to bring down the cost. And earlier you spoke about how, you know, your experience and relationship with council and departments, you know, really help you, um, you know, effectively use the office, in particular the, the power and ability as central to it of auditing. And I was wondering if there's any particular priorities you have going to that, that, you know, given like, you know, that, okay, this is a program that we've been working on for a long time, but it just hasn't been working out the way we wanted it to, or that we think it, I think it could function better and that you really are keen to dig into on this, you know, and particularly in the sense of like making sure, you know, that the money that is allocated uh, to these programs is actually getting to the people who, who need them since they're still, as you said, you know, homelessness is, is up for by 43%. Uh, and, you know, there's obviously a great concern about making sure that the money is getting to people who, who are in desperate need of it. So I was wondering if you have any particular priorities that you would like to uh, tell us about. I mean, my general priorities, homelessness has to be number one. It's the crisis of our time. And it's, it's going to take longer than people would wish to, to solve this problem. Uh, but uh, if, if we don't take a number of steps and, and really use creativity, uh, I think this problem will, will continue unabated almost indefinitely. We have to change a lot of our policies and programs to do it. Also, 
it, it may be too early this moment, but mm -hmm. over the next eight years, uh, we're going to have to make dramatic changes uh, in terms of adjusting to climate change, not only preparing for it, but to halt our, our production of greenhouse gases. So we're, we're gonna have to get to net zero in Los Angeles, I believe by 2030. And I have a motion for a moonshot goal to get us there. Um, but I think we'll need to keep looking at those programs over the next eight years because there's so many of them and which are being implemented, which aren't, which aren't being funded and should. Um, so actually my, my personal top priority will be making sure that we focus on climate change because I believe we've only got the eight years that I'll have. So it's sort of perfect timing. And we can't just do it here. LA is the most watched city in the world. So we have to be the example that other cities and other states and other countries can follow. So we've got to do everything right. We've got to do it early and we've got to do it efficiently. Uh, another thing which uh, I probably should spend some time on because I've, it's, it's everybody's issue um, is how do you make the LAPD more efficient? How do you make the fire department more efficient? What can you do? Um, and I've been working on this to varying degrees since I've been on council and in some areas before. Uh, one thing I've been pushing for is to hire civilians to do civilian jobs uh, because uh, there, there's a goal of having a certain amount of sworn officers. I always thought the goal number was silly as opposed to tasks. Mm -hmm. and We've always had a few hundred officers at least behind desks doing civilian work. And it's just to keep the number, but when, when they need to cut LAPD, they don't cut sworn, they cut civilians. So I have pushed to hire more civilians with some degree of success. Uh, I think we really need to have a civilian in every civilian job because they cost a lot less, they're easier to train, um, it, it just makes complete sense. And often their training is more on target than a sworn officer doing clerical work. I'd also work, which I have done, and to varying degrees of success in eliminating the overtime bank. Because when we don't have the budget, even in non-emergencies, we'll bank overtime. So we owe it to the officers. So we have millions in banked overtime, but it's a lose-lose because the officers that do the overtime want to be paid, not 30 years from now. But when you do pay them on retirement, they might earn the overtime at $60,000 a year, and they might retire in a prominent position and be paid the overtime at a rate of $200,000 plus a year. So we're, we're hurting the officers at the front end, and we're you know, helping to drive up costs for LAPD on the back end. Um, well, we can just touch on one, one, one other issue here that is uh, always in the, because you know, we, we talk about the top issues for LA voters and homelessness, climate change, you know, crime, police, social justice always come up. And the other big one is, is affordability. And as we know, the state of California has laid out that the city of Los Angeles, you know, has a goal of, of constructing over 500,000 housing units over the next 10 years in order to meet the market demand, to stabilize the market. And so if we're talking about the next 10 years, that obviously overlaps with the next eight years of a controller's uh, potential two terms. So I was wondering what you see your role in, in participating in that prospecting to make sure that we are on track to stabilizing the housing market, um, or if there's any role that you foresee yourself particularly being involved in there. Well, I, I, I think we want to do that in terms of providing the total number of units, but I think the state doesn't have its priorities straight. So it's focused on SB 9 and 10, which from my point of view, primarily enriches developers and it's written to avoid any requirement to provide affordable housing. So it's based on the, uh, the trickle down theory of economics uh, popularized by Reagan. Um, if you give tax breaks to billionaires and huge corporations, it'll trickle down and everybody will be economically lifted up. Doesn't work. I don't think it works in housing either. I know in Seattle at one time, which is a much smaller city than us, they built 24,000 new units in one year, which was huge. Um, rents did go down $2 a unit temporarily. It really did nothing. 
Um, what we really need to do is focus on actually incentivizing affordable housing, which uh, I think is more important at the state level and at our local level. Um, and I've tried to do some of that. Uh, I have legislation for adaptive reuse of office buildings, which the office market is gonna change dramatically after COVID and virtual office work. Um, so those vacant buildings, vacant floors uh, could be converted to housing. I think that could provide a lot of affordable and workforce level housing. I think we also need to streamline our development process, but especially for affordable housing, but all of it, we have one of the most convoluted processes and we apply it to ourselves and we're constantly shooting ourselves in the foot as we try to produce HHH housing. We've even made mistakes that I'm aware of where we're paying our construction people for HHH housing four to six months late. There's no excuse for it. We're bankrupting the companies that are working for us and nobody's gonna to wanna to build this stuff for us anymore. So we've gotta have the sense to take these steps. I think a lot of it can be identified uh, with the kind of analysis and auditing that the controller's office can do. But again, I'm not waiting for that. I'm working on all these issues now. Great. Um... Well, and then just also, because you mentioned, I think the uh, the climate change controller has a nice ring to it. So I hope that you can make that true uh, since we all know that's a, the, the fundam a fundament fundamental issue uh, for all of us here. What Do you have any particular thoughts given- I think climate change is my meaning in life. Well, uh, so great. The goal and uh, I hope to, to see things turn around uh, during my lifetime. So are there any particular programs that you would like to see or, or particular, like, I guess, think of this from the perspective of the controller's office, like audits or tools at your disposal that you'll have and are, will be able to use to make sure that the effects of climate change legislation aren't passed directly on to our unhoused and most vulnerable populations? Or how do you ensure equity and, and, and fairness in that process as well? Because well, that, that's one of the things that makes it so complicated, right? Well, one of the goals of the Climate Emergency Mobilization Office, which my legislation created, um, is to focus first on the communities that have traditionally been hardest hit by pollution, which are black and brown communities. So when, as we provide steps that provide relief, we focus there first. And we've created a program of community assemblies, and those will take place in those frontline communities primarily to get the feedback on, on how we can help them. Um, we're also very focused and otherwise we will have uh, very powerful uh, employees and industries fighting us tooth and nail is how do we transition people out of good jobs in the oil and gas industry into good jobs doing environmental mitigation. So that has to be a focus. So far, I think uh, nationally, internationally, it was in a lousy job. So there are, are some very low paid jobs in the solar industry, uh, they're really underpaid. Um, we can't just let that happen. We need to identify jobs that are similar so people will be willing rather than fighting us to transition to good jobs in other industries. But we have so many programs, we have so many ideas and we're going to have more and which ones are getting implemented and, and how? I mean, it's not in the council's control. It's really largely the mayor that implements them. Um, and I don't know if we know how well we're doing. I think it really will take some significant focus uh, by the controller now and, and building in the next eight years to really make this happen. Well, I'm very glad to hear about your, your focus on that. It's, um, let's say it's it, and, you know, the existential threat of our time. So it's... Uh, it is obviously foundational. We are under 30 minutes. Um, I wanted to give you the floor one more time to come back to an issue I mentioned at the very beginning on how obviously for the first time we have LA municipal elections in, in an even year, right? Or coinciding with regular midterms. So we're hopefully gonna have hundreds of thousands of voters who have never participated in city elections before, voting for the first time, learning about all these different offices, the controller, the city council, the city attorney, and participating and trying to see what they can, what they want in these leaders that they've maybe never voted for before. And I wonder if you have any particular 
um, message for them that you want them to, again, as you say, before they, they take their 17 minutes to decide who to vote for in the election, anything that they should um, just know about the process and about their city government um, and about you know, why they should be excited to participate in this election overall. Well, I think this is one of the most underrated offices of government. I think people don't realize the, the massive impact you can actually have. And you have a bully pulpit too. So if you have ideas, you have the ability to, to go out there and advocate for them and make as much of a difference as anyone on the city council. My, my fear is that we won't take full advantage of the fact that we're now in even years and we can expect a much bigger electorate. Because what happens sometimes, some people just drop off and say, city controller, what's that? It sounds kind of wonky and not vote on it. Uh, the next worst is there are a number of people that don't take their 17 minutes, they take 17 seconds. And they say, oh, that's a nice sounding name. Or I like that valid title, that sounds controller-ish. Um, but they don't really dig in. So I hope, and I'm counting on organizations like yours, that people will actually educate themselves on what the controller does, what kind of impact an elected controller can have. Because you do other things as a controller too. You're the paymaster for the city. You get the checks written. You actually take thousands of checks sometimes and put them in an armored car and move them from one place to another. But all those things are, are pretty routine and we have a great staff. So all those things could be done by the people that are there. We have great auditors. Uh, what we really need is vision from the controller. That's what the elected controller provides. And certainly that's what I hope to provide. Um, and I hope if someone else wins that they provide that, that uh, they're not just looking for the next office to run for, but they, they actually have the focus and the qualifications to do the job. All right. Well, I really appreciate that. We're, we're out here trying to educate uh, the entire public about the importance of your election and every single uh, municipal seat on the ballot this year. So we're excited to hear from you again as the months proceed and from every other candidate out there, just letting people know how important it is to uh, believe that they can make a difference because we absolutely can. Uh, and we have a great opportunity this year to uh, shape the next uh, you know, four, eight years of our city uh, and again, really grateful to you, Council Member, for joining us here today. To all our participants, thank you as well. Again, if you have questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to email them to contact at risetogether.la. And then make sure to follow us online at Rise Together LA in order to find out about our next interviews coming up. We'll also have more forums coming up in the future, other exciting content about uh, what we can be looking forward to in the city. Uh, Council Member, any last words for us? Well, just thank you for this opportunity and, and I hope your organization continues to grow and educate the public on, on important offices and important issues. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your time and look forward to seeing everyone here at the next uh, series in our uh, list of candidate interviews here and we'll see you all out uh, in the city. Hope everyone has a good night and we'll talk to you later. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a good night.